I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Prabhat Jha, who's going to speak to us on death, poverty, and tobacco taxes. Um, Prabhat is the founding director at the Center for Global Health at St. Michael's Hospital and holds several positions of appointments at the, at the University of Toronto. And um, I, I just want to say, I, I, I think Prabhat's one of the most influential people on tobacco uh, in the world today. And I, I was wondering why that was the case, sort of think about why. And it seems to me he does a great job of combining impeccable research and extremely clear writing and speaking. Um, and uh, I can say that, uh, in a sense, the reason I'm here and the reason I'm talking about this topic or interested in this topic is because of Prabhat. Um, I was working at the IDB in the 90s on health in Latin America and had the opportunity of hearing Prabhat give a talk, a uh, slide, and I remember there were like three slides in a row that just sort of like went, bam, bam, bam. And I thought, wow, this is, uh, you know, this is among the largest uh, global health risks in the world. I mean, it really is one of the largest global health risks. And a lot of people, you know, it's sort of like something that's out there, no, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, these are the big things. No, tobacco is one of the biggest, <coughs> biggest health risks. Um, the second thing is uh, it's one of the most underappreciated, so we really aren't putting as much effort into it as we, we might. And then the, the final thing is that it's one of the most unnecessary. Uh, if tobacco companies disappeared tomorrow, um, except for the transitional effects on people who have addiction to nicotine, um, the world would probably be a pretty good place. And there aren't a lot of other kinds of products out there that you could uh, just off, you know, offhandedly say that about. So, um, what, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a convert, uh, but I think that Prabhat's done this work in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, in 1999, he had a, uh, a report at the World Bank curbing the epidemic. Uh, that and other papers were influential, at leading to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, um, which was WHO's first international treaty. Uh, he's also had influence on some minor players in the world, like Bill Gates and Mayor Bloomberg on uh, dealing with tobacco, and uh, advised governments in Trinidad and Tobago, Mexico, India, and the Philippines. Um, and I was pleased to see the WHO gave you an award on No Tobacco Control Day just this last June to recognize your work. Um, th this is not all that Prabhat does. He's also uh, doing a fascinating uh, investigation, the Million Death Study in, in India, which is looking at all causes of death um, and risk factors. And he's the series editor for Disease Control Priorities Number 3. Um, so with all this, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Prabhat give us his talk on death, poverty, and tobacco taxes. Please welcome Prabhat Chan. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, that's a buildup which can only lead to disappointment. <laughs> uh, I'd like to talk about death and poverty which are avoidable and taxes which are not, but, and link the two. And I'm going to start with my conclusions, which are that on current patterns, there will be a billion smoking deaths this century. Many of you know that statistic already. But it's important to note that we already know where the problem is. In just 16 countries, there's going to be, there are already about 500 million smokers or uh, soon to be smokers, just below age 35. And on current patterns, you can expect about 250 million deaths among those. New evidence, which surprisingly has been only recently gathered, shows that smoking leads to about a decade of life lost, but cessation is ridiculously effective. And I'll talk about taxes in particular, the tripling of excise tax worldwide would reduce smoking by a third and perhaps avoid about 200 million premature deaths and have a nice benefit of raising more revenue. I will talk about tobacco control and taxes in the poor, and obviously the importance of monitoring. So at the outset, I'm going to give you lots of numbers, and I have to apologize for that. You know, the criticism of epidemiologists <coughs> is that we're number crunchers like accountants. That's not quite true. Accountants have more personality than epidemiologists. <laughs> but let's start with some of the big numbers. So how many people are exposed worldwide? Well. There's about 1.3 billion smokers, 2 billion uh, drinkers, including modest drinking, and a smaller number of illicit drug users. I'm proud to say our Toronto mayor does all three. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at both his individual risk, but also the global numbers, the biggest risk really comes from smoking. But as I'll show you, also from binge drinking. 
So let's compare these risks briefly. I'm going to start with drinking as a comparison. And the key message here is don't drink like a Russian. Um, if you look, in most countries, smoking causes more deaths than drinking. But Russia is the exception. And that's in particular because of these binge patterns of drinking that have led to these enormous fluctuations in all-cause mortality in males in uh, Russia. So if you look at the patterns comparing against the UK, which is shown down here, can you see that? No. Anyway, uh, if down here is the UK, showing these gradual declines in death rates in this time period, and these wild fluctuations that occurred in the USSR and in Russia were really as a result of alcohol increases or alcohol decreases. So this is Gorbachev comes in, cuts down on alcohol, loses power. Yeltsin comes in, alcohol goes up. Ruble collapses, alcohol goes up, and now it's coming down. And in the study, very important study that David Zurtze did, we looked at <coughs> men who drank a bottle of vodka a day and versus controls. Now, you couldn't find any non-drinking Russian men in <laughs> Siberia. So the controls are those that had only half a bottle a week. The controls are 20 shots a week. So. And in those, look at the enormous excess, a big excess from medical cause, including what was coded as heart attack, but actually wasn't heart attack. It was drinking until the heart stopped. Now, let's also compare obesity, which has also been described as, well, this is as big a risk coming as, uh, as smoking. But they're very different epidemics. As I'll show you, smoking leads to about a decade of life loss, and that was established first by Richard Dahl uh, in 2005. By contrast, obesity, at least measured as adult obesity, leads to that same decade of life loss only if you're very, very obese, meaning a body mass index of 43. So uh, it, take my uh, body mass as an example. I would have to gain well over 100 pounds to get a body mass uh, approaching 40, and that might lead to a decade of life loss. More modest levels of obesity, which are common in the, the US, lead to about three years of life loss. And, but in contrast, being a typical smoker leads to a decade of life loss. Now, we know what to do about smoking. We know less about what to do about obesity, but we do know that the mechanism of obesity very much involve control of blood pressure. So I also like to think of this kind of like, this is the Chris Christie graph and this is the John Boehner graph. <laughs> you, can, you tend to think Chris Christie is high at risk, but in fact, not, uh, he does have certainly a high BMI, but he's on pills that would lower his risk of vascular events. So he's close to actually the three year rate. People don't talk about John Boehner's health, but him being a typical smoker expects to face about an on average a 10 year loss of life. Okay, surprisingly, the evidence on how extreme these hazards are is really only gathered in the last, uh, uh, last two years. So on October 28, 2012, on the 100th birth centenary of uh, the late Sir Richard Dahl, there was a meeting in Oxford where worldwide evidence was compiled. And sure enough, what you see is the startling um, familiarity or similarity of risks about a decade of life lost among UK doctors and UK women in our studies of the general population in the US among Japanese atomic bomb survivors and Indian men who smoke cigarettes. All now face about a decade of life lost. And good news and bad news on the smoking front from the New England Journal of Medicine. They state flat out smokers lose at least one decade of life expectancy over non-smokers on average. The encouraging news here is quitting before 40 reduces the smoking-related death risk by 90% compared to continuing on as a smoker. So there's Brian Williams summarizing 60 years of epidemiology in 22 seconds. <laughs> so this is uh, the evidence, for example, from our study in the U.S. looking at a nationally representative cohort. And I like to call this the, the death book study because it used a very novel system, the National Death Index and ask questions of people who smoke and drink and various other factors uh, and the general population and then followed them up and found what they died of. 
And this is done as uh, a routine, publicly available data set. And the main finding is now that women who smoke like men die like men, that earlier risks <laughs> that had shown that uh, the risks, for example, of lung cancer in women, when it was measured early on, for example, in the studies in the 1960s, showed no excess in lung cancer. In fact, this was argued by the tobacco companies to say, well, how can smoking be a cause of lung cancer when Luther Terry issued his report saying, look, it's not killing women. And then later on, the early studies showed that, yes, risks were increasing, but they were well short of the male risks. And now the male and female risks are comparable. The more you smoke, the higher the risks, and it increases substantially with age. So today, women who smoke in the United States can expect a substantially decreased probability of living till age 80. Now, you can't live forever, but living in good health at age 80 is a reasonable proposition. And you see how markedly different they are. Among smokers, 38% only will reach age uh, 80. And among non-smokers, 70% would. And this is adjusted for all sorts of differences between smokers and non-smokers, for example, in alcohol use. And it's the same in men. The good news is that quitting, particularly before age 40, is really effective. If those that quit, on an average of by age 30, get back almost the full 10 years of life lost, those that quit by average age 40 get back nine, quit by 50 get back six, quit by 60 get back four. And this applies not just to all-cause mortality, but even something like cancer of the lung, where there is a residual risk many years after quitting, but that risk you have to compare, yes, it's elevated, six-fold higher risk, but that's compared to something like a 25-fold 25 risk, 25 higher risk for continuing to smoke. So worldwide today, the epidemic has not yet matured, so we know these patterns in these different populations. Um, in China and in India, the mature cigarette risks are already appearing, but in other populations, Bangladesh, South Africa, are so far are similar to what women were in the 1950s. The risks are modest, but we know now that the full potential will be reached. And that's important because in 16 countries, there's about 500 million smokers, just 16 countries, all below age 30 or 35. And uh, in these populations, on current patterns, we can safely say that their risks, smokers below age 35, do involve facing a full decade of life loss. That uncertainty has been removed just in the last two years. <coughs> so if you look at the Chinese patterns, they're actually indicative. Chinese uh, adult or Chinese male smoking patterns look exactly like US adults, but just 40 years later. So in 1990, 12% of all men were in middle age were killed by smoking. And that was the same as 1950 in the United States. By 2030, it'll be the same as the peak of the US epidemic. And in fact, in recent years, uh, unfortunately, there's been a big increase in cigarette production. So the risks actually might be even greater than we've shown here. In India, from our studies, we already know that those that smoke BDs, men who smoke BDs, which is the most commonly consumed type of tobacco, lose six years of life. The few women who smoke BDs lose eight years. The few men who smoke cigarettes lose 10 years. And a concern is that the BD is being displaced by the cigarette. More and more cigarette sales are crowding out BDs, and they're likely to be more harmful. Plus, they carry the full marketing force of Western uh, tobacco companies. So let's turn to interventions. Well. Uh, as Bill alluded to, the most important intervention that can help smokers quit is higher taxes. 100% higher uh, price means at least 20% of current smokers will quit, and there's greater effects in the poor and in the youth. The set of non-price measures are important, involving warning labels, ads, uh, complete bans on advertising and promotion and also access to helping smokers quit. And these are the core of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control that has been adopted. So, uh, and I want to show you some evidence, and in fact, emerging evidence suggests that this price responsiveness is actually something that we might actually have built in in our, in our biology. In various animal models, 
you see the same kind of overall price elasticity for various addictive goods um, in different types of animal species, suggesting that this price elasticity we've got is actually pretty universal. Now, where has this been implemented? Well, in the United States and in Canada, we have consumption from something like 12 cigarettes per day down to about six, but it took us about 35 years to do so. The French, yes, the French, you wouldn't think would be a, a model of tobacco control, but actually uh, it has been. And they have consumption from six cigarettes per day down to three. And they did it only in 15 years. And the reason they were able to do it has nothing to do with Carla Bruni, by the way, but it's got a lot to do with Jacques Chirac raising taxes from 1992. Uh, and he raised it 5% above inflation, such that the price uh, tripled, consumption fell, and, oh, by the way, just to show you this plateau, this is when Nicolas Sarkozy came in and uh, he uh, put a break on the price increase. So hopefully, Francois Hollande will go back and raise this, uh, raise this again. And in South Africa, it's a very similar story, going from more modest levels that they were able to have consumption from about four cigarettes per day down to two for adults as a result of big price increases. In France, the important impact that can also be seen on lung cancer. Now, lung cancer at young ages is mostly due to recent exposure and smoking, and it's reasonably easily diagnosed. So look at the contrast before 1997. In the UK, lung cancer rates in males are dropping, in women, they, they were going up, but that increase was aborted. In France, by contrast, was going up substantially, and the female epidemic was picking up. But what happened after 1997, when the price impact and the consumption impact was felt, boom, big decrease. Just look at the contrast on the right. Big decrease in the male deaths uh, from lung cancer, and the female epidemic stabilized. So worldwide, however, the use of taxes, particularly excise taxes, is really quite low. It, excise taxes are well over half of the cost of the street price in high income countries, but uh, about a third in low income countries. And moreover, there's important strategies that the tobacco industry has been doing of trying to keep the range in prices so, such, uh, so extreme. For example, in China, they vary tenfold. So even if there's a tax increase, then <coughs> the uh, smokers are able to switch down as a result of the price variation. So a really important strategy is to raise the tax, the excise tax, by a large fixed amount on all lengths, so you narrow the gap between the most and least expensive brands. And in fact, that's what we've recommended to the Indian government. I'll just skip that in the interest of time. Now, I've talked mostly about taxes, but there are other effective interventions, one of which is on uh, warning labels. Australia has moved to these prominent warning labels where the only advertisement for the brand is this small um, label. And this suggests in early evidence to be quite effective at increasing cessation rates. In Canada, they've been using these uh, more prominent warning labels for some time. And in fact, there are studies that men who go to the store and are handed one of these say, no, don't give me this one. Give me the one that says smoking will kill me. Um, so, so they all work. Um, what are the major objections to tobacco taxes? And we'll pick this up in the discussion. But they're really in four areas. Job losses, but now the tobacco industry is actually not making this argument because they realize very simply that money not spent on tobacco is spent on other goods and services generating um, alternative employment. Revenue loss is commonly still referred to, and people talk about the Laffer curve. Um, and in fact, we came across a recent uh, document by the tobacco industry that was making this case. But the reality is that even in very high taxation settings, for example, in Norway or Sweden, you still have not seen that point that might be there eventually, or in theory, where taxes will go down in response to uh, higher, uh, higher levels. So the two big arguments are that smoking hurts the poor and that smoking or taxes hurt the poor, and that uh, taxes cause smuggling. Now let's deal with this in a little more detail. The key message really for the poor is very simple. Because the poor are more price responsive, they quit more in response to higher taxes, and 
because tobacco causes a big proportion of the poor rich differences in mortality, they contribute to the more progressive health gains. The main issue on smuggling is that even in the presence of modest smuggling, you still get a win-win. Higher revenue, decreased consumption. So let's start with poverty. Well, this is an analysis of the inequalities in the death uh, rates, risks of death, excuse me, between 35 to 69 among men by education level in Poland and the US. In those with lower education, the mortality rates are actually much higher, so that 50% of those with low levels of education in Poland are dead before age 70. By contrast, only a quarter or so are dead before in those that have higher education. But of that difference, smoking accounts for nearly half of the low income group, but only a quarter of the higher income group. And the same in the US. So that if you took away the effects of smoking, the inequalities between rich and poor would be at least half as great as uh, they are today. And we see this evidence nicely emerging in Canada, which has used taxes aggressively over the last two decades or so. Uh, three decades, excuse me. Uh, there's been a substantial decrease in the mortality uh, from smoking, not just in the poorest income men, but also in the richest. But the absolute declines have been comparable in the poor than in the rich. So the poor are not getting left behind as a result of tobacco taxes. Further analysis that we've done for China, for the Asian Development Bank, suggests that if you look at the distribution of the marginal taxes and the health benefits, the marginal taxes uh, are uh, paid mostly by higher income groups, which is shown in the lighter green. But the health benefits are mostly or concentrated in the lower socioeconomic groups. And if you look at income as the metric, then there's still a net gain for uh, the lowest quintiles. And it's the same in the United States. The extra tax from a large increase is mostly borne by not the poor, but by the richer, but the benefits are greater in the, uh, in the poor. So smuggling worldwide, yes, this is an important concern that the gaps between uh, export volumes and import volumes gives you some sense. Something like 12% of global tobacco consumption might be smuggled. But the main uh, reason behind this appears really to be the industry practices. Smuggling is a very effective way for the tobacco industry to scare finance ministers and also to um, get market share for their products. And Canada is a beautiful test case for the industry where they organized smuggling of Canadian brands across the native reserves on the US-Canadian border, such that uh, Jean Chrétien, the Canadian Prime Minister, had to lower taxes in response to counter-smuggling. Well, what happened? The real price did fall in response, but consumption went up, particularly in youth. And in more recent years, they've found that the revenues actually fell by much greater than expected. Thankfully, they corrected this mistake, but this is the tobacco industry's worldwide uh, test case that they go around and they counsel ministers of finance that don't do what Canada did, you're gonna have a big smuggling problem. Now, later on, there were lawsuits that showed that the industry was actively helping the uh, natives to smuggle their own brands, and that in the absence of industry support, <coughs> you actually don't get this large-scale organized smuggling, and that's very relevant in other populations. I'll just skip this in the interest of time. So let me turn in the last couple of minutes to the political economy. The obvious obstacle to the sensible policies is tobacco uh, industry opposition, but it is possible. And I raised the example of Mexico uh, with the wonderful leadership of um, my friend Maurizio uh, Hernandez, who uh, argued for a 10 peso tax hike in Mexico. He ended up with a seven peso hike, but this, how did he do it? And you have to remember, this is Mexico, Carlos Slim, the richest man uh, sometimes in the world, or second richest, uh, and a majority or a big shareholder in Philip Morris, uh, has enormous political influence. But in that, how did they manage? Well. A, it, I think, involved these key elements, which is good analysis. They, so they had 
good epidemiological analysis, which we contributed to, very careful price elasticity and poverty analysis. They had in place an immediate system that was able to show that, in fact, revenues were going up and consumption was coming down. Um, and uh, they had one political champion, Senator Saro, just one. And he was very smart, organized. He did things like organize NGO protests on the Ministry of uh, Finance steps. And he asked the film cameras to show uh, them that, well, it looked like 200 people, or there's only 15 people waving placards. And he got it on the press that people are arguing save lives by higher taxes. And that's what their logo was, 10 pesos for 1 million. And they had broad, soft earmarking. They didn't do hard earmarking that the Ministry of Finance don't like, but they said they will raise the extra revenue and use it on poverty. So this deliberate effort, I believe, is actually a model for the kind of things that are needed in other countries. We've seen this recently in the Philippines, where the IMF, the World Bank, WHO, ADB, uh, us and others came together to support the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance's attempts to have a large tax hike. And they had one champion, which was the president, and lots of political opposition, but this actually does, does work. So even in the face of enormous profits and lobbying by the tobacco industry, it is possible to effect change. I really do want to emphasize that. Now, uh, some fun things that we're trying in India is to see whether you can actually randomize tobacco control. So what we've done is uh, work to take all 600 districts of India and create local tobacco cessation guidelines, training, and advice for the local 300 collectors to enforce the existing laws. And we're testing whether if you give advice and local training, does it raise local cessation rates in a randomized design, 300 intervention, 300 control. So uh, let me just skip this in the interest of time. Um, well, I'll add this one. Since we're in the season of everyone wanting to propose new sustainable development goals, I'll give you my three, which I like as the three 300. So, which is 100 countries would have reliable information on causes of death, including risk factors like smoking, which I just showed you. 100 million current smokers would quit smoking as a result of taxes. And in a later seminar, maybe we can talk about secondary treatment. 100 million would have existing vascular disease uh, intervention. So again, conclusions. Lots of deaths that are avoidable, and we know now the mature risks. Prolonged smokers are going to lose about a decade of life, but cessation is amazingly effective. Taxes, particularly narrowing the gap between the most and least expensive brands to a large uh, excise tax, should be almost the singular strategy, I believe, for tobacco control. Concerns about the poor are mostly displaced, but uh, still legitimate, and we need a lot more ongoing monitoring. Happy to take questions uh, and criticisms. When you talk about Mexico, it sounds like the value of the information is critical. And I'm thinking about a contract. I, I read about a case in Uganda where they had a tax raise uh, proposal on the table, I think, in 2011. But there was no public discussion. The thing was reduced significantly because of industry lobbying. But by 2013, the NGOs had sort of mobilized, and there was a, they were able to respond. So is that sort of a, a typical pattern? Is it is. You know, and I. Um, I, I remember having, um, uh, when I was at the World Bank, the chief economist of uh, British American Tobacco came to see me. And um, it was a Friday afternoon. And he didn't uh, get any audience at the uh, WHO. So he came by, uh, some at the World Bank. So I invited him in. And uh, I said Friday afternoon, it was about uh, 4.45. I said, hey, when do you say we and I go get a drink? So I took him out, got him a couple of scotches. He loosened up. And he basically said, look, our strategy is very simple. We, uh, we try to uh, use smuggling to scare finance ministers. And everything is about keeping 
the prices low as possible, but if not, making sure there's real market segmentation so that any uh, price response can lead to smokers switching down, or we can push more of the lower end cigarettes so that smokers will want those. And we've seen that in the Indian case very beautifully, that the industry's strategy in response to our efforts, funded by the Gates and others to get the Ministry of Finance to raise tobacco taxes, was to go in the back door, or in the front door, and um, argue, look, you know what, you've got people arguing for tobacco taxes, we'll give in a little bit, but raise it on the part of the tobacco that is uh, not a big market share, make a big press release that says you're increasing taxes 72%, but that's on a minuscule share of the market, and leave the market so it's, you know, it's not too much disruption, people have a choice. So this is the standard advice that they're giving. And uh, worldwide, that is the strategy that they're following. The tobacco industry, unlike the tobacco control community, has organized briefs from a few of the major multinationals that exactly says this is what you should do. So they're all cut from the same cloth. They're all giving pretty much the same advice in various countries. And the heart of it is just to counter exactly this. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we know that, then I'm, I mean, you know, my sense is why aren't we as a community uh, going out and absolutely countering that? Mm -hmm. Because as we've gathered from Mexico and the Philippines, ministers of finance do listen. Mm -hmm. We give them the right advice and work with them, they do listen. Mm -hmm. And what about, I mean, the other side of this that I've, I've seen a lot of times is that both in politicians but also with economists working on fiscal policy, they're, um, that a lot of them will be sympathetic. Um, but particularly in the fiscal policy arena, there's sort of like this, this set of things which are best practices in fiscal mm -hmm. policy. You want to broaden the tax base. You don't want to make very large jumps in taxes. You prefer ad valorem to specific taxes. It's sort of like all these things that work in the mm -hmm. normal tax world. And when I'm talking to them, I'm trying to convince them that the tobacco tax world is significantly different. You want to actually do all the reverse. Yes. Um, how, how do you find that part of the discussion? I, mean, I think uh, we, what is needed, I believe, is actually an update of, of uh, curbing the epidemic, ideally produced by the World Bank and the IMF, that actually lays out why you should deal with tobacco differently. Mm -hmm. The empiric evidence is unambiguous that by using excise versus ad valorem, you get greater reductions in consumption, you have uh, greater stability in the revenue streams, and you also have less problems with contraband and tax evasion. So in that context, it's that should be what ministers of finance like. They never, yeah. you know, they never met a tax they didn't like, but it's the question of implementation. Mm -hmm. And the global advice that's given on that. Now I know, for example, the IMF has got a position paper on tobacco taxes. I, I don't quite know why they haven't released it, they did present it in Philippines at that seminar, and it was very progressive, and it was very sensible. So you know, I think that is still uh, an, an actionable part of the global agenda. Uh -huh. And you, know, you sense a little bit of frustration in my voice, which is legitimate, is that we should be doing this stuff. It's uh -huh. actually not that complicated. Okay, good. Um, I guess the last question I want to ask before opening up was about China, because most of the tobacco company strategies I'm aware of are from British Tobacco, Philip Morris, those kinds of things. China has a state company that sells tobacco. You have the chart there, it's billions of cigarettes, and I was doing the quick, you know, what was the figure? It's like uh, $10,000 in profits per death. Yeah. This is the, the, the calculation on the, in the paper. Um, so these billions of cigarettes coming out of China. What, is China's, China playing a different role here, or is it? China similar? is different, mainly because the industry is so large and because uh, taxes are still a very significant proportion of the overall government revenue. The basic approach has been uh, don't touch the, the golden goose. Right? So even if you look at the example, when, um, the, when the Chinese president came to the US, he didn't get an audience with uh, George Bush, but did get one with Bill Gates. So Bill Gates in the room told them, well, why aren't you doing something about tobacco taxes? Uh, this was right after PCT2, which Bill Gates liked a lot. And uh, he was stunned, and all his, uh, his staff outside are smoking. Where, where did that come from? 
So what they did is to almost to placate one person, they announced a raise in one of their taxes, got a big press announcement out of it. But then later, they, they at the supply side, they have another tax. They cut that. So the net impact was zero. And I think it's uh, it just so the headline, yes, that taxes are increased, and the Gates Foundation folks that first heard about it were very pleased, as they should have been. Uh, but then they come around and do this other effort of cutting the tax. So China is going to be particularly complicated, and I think it involves having a lot more uh, effort, perhaps at the provincial level, to get some changes. I mean, there's very layers of elements there. The other concern is that the source of uh, the, if you look at the profits from the tobacco industry in China, they're enormous. And that is certainly, a, it's a big source of uh, revenue and basically of political slush funds and other things. So for all those reasons, it's really a difficult thing to, to take on. My sense is that if, if a lot more evidence comes out about the emerging really big hazards of smoking in China, and you see a lot more visible patients dying from lung cancer and other efforts, then that might lead to a little bit of political pressure the other way. Uh, but it's it's particularly it's difficult. It's a different community. Yeah, very different. Okay, thanks. Any questions? Please identify yourself and uh... My name is Saf Philly student of Dubai University in Virginia, and I'm of Sierra Leone, West Africa. You talked about tobacco, or cigarette in general. I want to know how the international community is going to handle poverty, incentive, and smoking. When I was 11 years old, back in the village in Sierra Leone, West Africa, the British, during that period in the 70s, they colonized Sierra Leone. So they took, it, they took off a campaign that smoking is dangerous to their health. So my great, great aunt, instead of for her to smoke, she used the tobacco leaf, they, they patched it, pound it, window it, then he sells it to the public. At that age, I asked my, I said, but you were told not to smoke. I said, this is the best way that the government will not know that we are smoking tobacco. No, what they did, just like the powdered tobacco, they put it right at the back of their tooth. So he, he told me, say, sir, he said, go to that house and buy this powdered tobacco. I went, bought it. Then on my way coming, I opened it, I tried it, put it, I said, oh. So I start uh, to feel giddiness. So I want to know the part that the internet, because if you want to stop smoking of cigarette, what are the incentives? Because you can't tell me to smoke, because if I'm a natural smoker, I don't smoke. Huh. They want me to stop for my own health. The incentive should be there. So like in Africa in particular, and Sri Lanka, it's very difficult to stop smoking, except you back it up incentive. So what incentive, or is there any incentive that the international community can provide so that cigarette smoking could be stopped? Well, you want to no, go ahead. Well, I think the incentives for the individual really are having good information about the hazards of smoking, but also the benefits of quitting. And we don't have particularly the latter, the benefits of quitting for many populations. So uh, the hazards of smoking, I think, are underestimated, uh, particularly in many settings in Africa, because you don't see a lot of people around you dying from smoking-related disease. Very different than AIDS, where you're seeing lots of people uh, in some settings dying of AIDS, and therefore it's, it does have an impact on behavior. In smoking, you don't see that yet. And that's because there's a really long lag, uh, uh, lag period. But I think one of the practical strategies would be to get much better information on the extent to which smoking is already killing people, particularly from tuberculosis uh, and chronic lung disease in Africa. The emerging evidence from South Africa suggests the risks are already very substantial. 
And that makes then the individual information. This is not you know, data from someplace else, it's local data. The other really important incentive is, uh, this is more for governments, is know that prices uh, are very effective, that higher prices will deter consumption. And we've seen that across uh, various populations. So you need to work both on the demand side by raising the demand for tobacco control but then on the supply side, I think governments can certainly raise tobacco taxes. Well, one of the things that was interesting in um, the article that Ravat published in the New England Journal of Medicine was mentioning that um, half of the people who die from tobacco-related uh, diseases in India are illiterate. Illiterate, yes. and, and it sort of got across to me the importance of the graphical warnings on cigarette packets. It says, you know, tiny lettering like you're in the United States. The Surgeon General, you know, says that smoking is bad for your health. Yeah. It's not just that it's not as effective in terms of a visual image, but actually people who can't read aren't going to have that yeah. benefit in the so. Next here. Uh, I'm Ed Almendar, uh, formerly from the World Bank. Uh, Ahmad, could you comment further on uh, the international trade negotiations, whether multilateral, regional, and bilateral, and the tobacco issue, as well as on the global effort through WHO, Framework Convention, and the like? Thanks. Well, uh, I think in terms of tobacco and trade, there's a really important ruling that uh, GATT made way back in, uh, the, I think, in the 1990s. And the WTO recently has confirmed that uh, this would, would stand and apply today, which was a test case in, um, I forget, do you remember where it was, Ron? Was it in Thailand or in? Yes. So the, the argument was there that the, uh, the Western, uh, tobacco companies were saying that the local restrictions on uh, advertising were a copyright infringement. It's the basis of even the tobacco uh, company's lawsuit against Uruguay. And uh, the GATT ruling, later upheld by WTO, was very simple. It said that country, I believe it was Thailand, could go as far as banning tobacco altogether, provided it banned foreign and domestic tobacco symmetrically. So uh, in that context, and they said that the public health regulations, if applied equally to foreign and domestic tobacco, can actually be as draconian as the government wishes. That's the decision for them. So I think the trade threat there is actually mostly from the interpretation of uh, those laws and the lobby pressures uh, that are happening to try to open up markets. The other element of the trade, which I think is not often discussed, is the trade in unmanufactured tobacco, which I think actually is the approach. Uh, Paul Eisenman is here, but he and I worked on this. Is It really, I think, should be much more liberal, that you want tobacco produced and traded very uh, flexibly from all markets. And ideally, more and more of those markets would be supplied, more and more, more of that shrinking market we be supplied out of African tobacco. That's a pro-poor strategy, but that's sensible agricultural policy. Um, so I think you know, on the trade part, again, it's a question of how much of this information is getting out to governments, that they have the authority under GATT and WTO to go as far as banning tobacco. They won't for political reasons, provided it's symmetrical. And you can't have uh, differences between domestic and foreign brands. That's the only, uh, that's the major trade uh, issue, I think. I'm Sandra Xartova from the U.S. Government Accountability Office. I have two questions. One is uh, if you could comment on the extent of illicit tobacco trade and how much revenue governments are losing from that, if you know, anybody is doing any studies, because again, this, the argument is to convince the finance ministers. I'm yeah. wondering if that's a convincing argument. And what, what extent China is a big player in this or not on this trade? And my second question is about e-cigarettes, which is something that we're now seeing in the yeah. United States controversial issue, FDA regulations, no one does not. So I'm sort of curious how you see the role of the cigarettes in all this. Well, in smuggling, the current estimates are that it's about 12% of uh, all global tobacco worldwide uh, tobacco sales are smuggled. And the determinants of those are actually not so much price differences, which you would expect, but actually the presence of organized smuggling networks. Usually, a, I mean, there's there's a worldwide smuggling network of criminal activity that'll take any product on which it can make money. 
they have to be abetted actively by the tobacco industry to actually get to the scale of, of getting really organized large-scale smuggling. And if you look at examples from countries that went from low tax to actually quite a high tax, take South Africa, sure enough, their reported smuggling levels went from zero to 6%. Now again, there's a caution in those because many of those are actually reported by the tobacco industry. So they have an incentive to actually say, oh no, it's not 6%, it's 8%, it's going up every year. And they very much over uh, dramatize the, the actual smuggling level. So you need more independent estimates. But let's say in South Africa that was actually true. What is the net impact despite that increase? Revenues more than doubled in real terms up until recent years. And consumption fell by half. So it's still a win-win for most countries in that context. Now, the role of China is a little bit ambiguous currently because most of the Chinese uh, produced tobacco is actually consumed within the country. But as these uh, new agreements are shaping place between British American Tobacco and uh, other multinationals and some Chinese companies, they might be thinking very much that, well, that might be our way of supplying the contraband in all of the Asian markets. But they cannot do it on their own. You, this is large, whole-scale uh, smuggling. You're talking huge containers and organized efforts. It's not buying you know, some duty-free cigarettes and putting them in a suitcase and bringing them across. So. On your question on e-cigarettes, I think the, the bottom line is that the science still needs to catch up with the policy. We know that uh, cessation efforts with e-cigarettes will be helpful for getting current smokers uh, to quit or at least to reduce their amount. Uh, the evidence is pretty clear on that, some randomized trials. The main concern is that is it a gateway for children to start smoking and is it a, something that deters people from actually uh, from uh, quitting all uh, outright. And I think there's two really important positions on current science that you can make. One is uh, to really take away all of the glamorous advertising that's occurred around e-cigarettes. You know, Jenny McCarthy, who's one of my favorite vaccine uh, heroes, is uh, also now doing these ads, glamorous ads, glamorizing uh, e-cigarettes. And I think that has a deliberate signal uh, for kids uh, that can be prevented. So just completely banning any type of large-scale promotion. But at the same time, making it reasonably accessible to adults, I think, is a reasonable strategy. One of the subtle arguments there is that the ownership of the e-cigarettes has to be separate than the ownership of the tobacco industry. Philip Morris shouldn't be in the e-cigarette business because they may think, well, if we start e-cigarettes, then in fact our cost for producing e-cigarettes is much higher than for the cigarettes, so we'll use it as a bridge and get people to switch to our more profitable products. So you know, it's just like the lawsuits against Microsoft. You have to separate the operating system from the internet browser. Uh, I think you need that similar kind of approach. Uh, but I think, unfortunately, I don't fully agree with the WHO position that they recently announced on e-cigarettes. I think that was not science-based. They should have said sensible things, like don't advertise, and let's actually call for a lot more quick research on whether it's actually a gateway or a cessation. Can I take um, maybe three questions together? Because we're coming down time. So if you want to go first, and Paul in the back, and question on, on the bear on you, what are the barriers you think to uh, see further progress on taxation? Uh, there's enough evidence now on the impact on quitting and even on revenue, yeah. but we still don't see enough progress. So what, and you mentioned that maybe we don't do enough as the public health community. So what could we do more of and what are the opportunities to see more action at country level on these taxes? Hi, um, Paul Holmes with Development Finance International. It's kind of a follow-on maybe to, to Laurent's question. Um, mine is basically, um, what do you see as the prognosis for raising uh, resources to address the issues that you've been you know, dealing with and talking about this morning? Um, 
we've got a lot of uptake at the country level, uh, you know, a lot of hunger, a lot of need. Uh, at the same time, if you take uh, Bloomberg and maybe Gates out of the equation, you've got virtually no funding for international tobacco control. What can we do about that? Um, can we get Paul in the back there? Um, thanks. I'm uh, Paul Eisenman, uh, independent uh, consultant. And first of all, it's a, a, a great uh, presentation, and I, I hope, Bill, that it will be uh, available on the CGT uh, yes. uh, uh, website. Um, I don't want to question the importance of all of the steps, the empower steps that you uh, described. Action needs to be taken on uh, all of them. <laughs> but you know, when you, when you think about it, following up on the last two very good uh, points, we've known not the whole story, but an awful lot of it for at least 15 years as applied to developing countries coming out in you're curbing the epidemic. So what would you say about that? We need to face up to the fact that this is essentially a political problem. So another round of curbing would be a great help in informing finance ministers and uh, others. But that's not going to answer, you know, I mean, it's a necessary step in, in communicating, but that's not going to really bring about the change. And following up on the last question, is really more resources, the cash, going to do it? Uh, we hope that cash can defeat the political power of the industry, but, you know, whether it's China or for that matter, or the United States and Washington, D.C., uh, the political power of industry is very, very strong. So what can we do to counteract that? And when, knowing we're dealing with an addiction here, so that lawmakers as well as finance ministers know and are under some pressure from the fact that they're going along with something that is killing lots of people unnecessarily, and uh, as you pointed out, uh, unlike in most other things, we know what can be done. So could you comment on that? I think uh, one more question back here, just, um, and then I'll take Hi, I'm Steve Rosner from USAID. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, issues around sustainable financing of development specifically, not not uh, what donors are going to give, but rather how countries are going to address their own health and other uh, uh, development priorities. Uh, you, you pointed out that, uh, that tobacco taxes are a relatively stable source of revenue. I don't know if I find that hard to believe, but I don't, I, the math doesn't add up for me. If you're saying that we're radically reducing consumption mm -hmm. um, of uh, tobacco over time with these things, I don't understand how it is a sustainable source of revenue, um, or one that's significant enough to address a, a, a bigger health challenges. And just to sort of follow on that, uh, I wonder if the dynamics of alcohol taxation are similar to or are they different from tobacco, and I would love to speak to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're kind of running out of time, so I think we'll take those four and well, give Prabhat a chance. Well, I mean, I think those three questions are very much related about um, what's needed to affect change and where will the resources come from. And I agree with uh, those sentiments very much, that it is a political problem. Now, how do you get politicians to change behavior? Well, um, I think we know that uh, peer interventions are important. So having more political champions, like Senator Saro and the Philippines president, uh, talk about what they've been able to accomplish, I think is one of, and, and that's also an actionable item. That's something that uh, the Gates Foundation and Bloomberg could actually mobilize. The ongoing attention to the health burdens, um, particularly as we're talking about 2030 goals in which uh, thankfully adult mortality is now being discussed broadly in the 2030 goals. The framework convention 
for tobacco control is mentioned in one of the 17 sub goals. Uh, I think that will help. And I think we also have to be not too pessimistic because we've got extraordinary successes where taxes uh, have been raised. I mean, you don't think of France as a model of tobacco control, but look what the remarkable decrease that they've had. Their smoking rates among adults, or quitting rates among adults, is way above the European average. They've had a much, much better reduction in, in uh, premature mortality than other places, notwithstanding other issues, including economic turmoil. So we need to get also more of the successes of tobacco control to get out, as Paul has been pointing out, that look at this extraordinary success that's occurring in high-income countries in cutting tobacco deaths, and yet the lack of progress in developing countries. I believe we have to aspire to a lot more of the political leaders uh, in developing countries who are saying, look, we, we don't want to be seen as the poor cousin in 2030. We want to be an equal cousin. And in that context, saying, well, here's something that uh, has worked so well, and you can co-opt it much faster. So we do need a, an entire political strategy around that. To come to uh, Stephen's question on taxes, you're absolutely right that uh, in the long term, if you had zero consumption, you'd have zero revenue from taxes. And that is an admirable long-term goal. But it really is long-term, that for all of the studies that have been done over uh, the over a 30-year period, even let's take the United Kingdom, even in a 30-year period, the consumption uh, fell from, well, fell about half. Deaths in uh, middle age in uh, the UK fell by half. But all that time, revenues in real terms doubled. So over a 30-year period, that kind of window, I think, is uh, reasonable to think about in terms of what you could use for tobacco taxes. Now, the reality is that taxes aren't going to be a big proportion of most budgets, nor should they be. And the main argument for these is really to cut consumption. I mean, in India, for example, taxes used to be 2% of the overall government revenue. It's down to about 1% because they're doing sensible tax expansion and uh, expanding the tax base. So I don't think we should hook ourselves too much in the argument that it's a great source of revenue to fund other stuff. I mean, it's great if you can get it. In China's case, it's very large, but that's peculiar to China. Other populations, it's a diminishing proportion. Uh, so in the long term, if we didn't have tobacco tax revenue, well, that'd be great because we wouldn't have tobacco debts either. And there are other sources of revenue that governments can mobilize. Great. I think that's uh, all we have time for today. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks to Prabhat for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.